All right, it's a fireside chat with Vanguard, so it's, we're, not doing, uh, we're not doing the skit up here, but welcome. If you're joining us virtually, uh, it's great to have you. We got the crew in New York, so we're, we're streaming this live from where we are. And uh, I from Vanguard, mm -hmm. and I, I, got it, I got it close, hopefully. Uh, but thanks so much for being here. We're gonna have a test talk about their experience in terms of uh, what they've been building towards from a data platform perspective. Some of that will involve Dremio, some of it won't. Uh, they're also gonna talk about what they're doing with AI and governance, and then uh, we're gonna have a little bit where we talk about um, how they're thinking about success and measuring success, which I know a lot of analytics leaders and data leaders are under pressure for right now, which is you know, you're, you, there's, there's sort of a big cost to what's going on. Hopefully at Dremio we're lowering that, but it's you know, how are you valuing other than cost as well in terms of moving forward? So if you don't mind just uh, introducing yourself and uh, tell, telling the audience you know, what you're up to at Vanguard. Sure, I can, I can do that. So, hey, hi everyone, this is Satesh Dundi from Vanguard. So uh, for people who do not know Vanguard, Vanguard is uh, one of the largest asset managers in the world. We have about uh, eight trillion worth of assets under management. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, we take a, a, we want to give uh, greater investment, uh, an opportunity towards greater investment success towards, uh, to everyone out there, like be it uh, our investors, our retail investors, and our institutional investors is something that we, is at forefront of what Vanguard does and what we do. And uh, we are actively looking at uh, the cost optimizations and giving back to our investments, uh, investors every, every way that we uh, take a stand at. And now, uh, so when it comes to uh, Dremio, uh, what brought us to uh, Dremio is that when, um, I think uh, it was about two years ago when we started uh, thinking about uh, our infrastructure in general. And, uh, and we, we, we were like, okay, what are the things that are really bothering our end users, be it our all data users, be it data analysts, data scientists, data uh, uh, machine learning engineers, or even uh, the business users who want to be uh, proficient with data and literate with data and have that insight. Uh, it, what we found is that uh, uh, right now we are facing challenges when it comes to performance with our existing systems, and uh, uh, the, there are cost uh, considerations that we uh, because a like, few of the platforms that we are, we use are rendering us costly, and uh, and at the end, end of the day we we do want to give a a superior user experience to our end uh, end users, a, everyone out there. So that prompted us uh, in the journey towards like identifying different vendors and going out and seeing, okay, what is the best uh, experience that we want to give out? And so, and at the, so we did a, a lot of evaluations on all, everyone on the market and landed, landed with Dremio, which uh, we are really happy about uh, so far. That's awesome. You know, you talked about uh, the initial challenge where you had sort of performance costs, and then you, it sounds like there was also a little bit like you're trying to get more people involved. Mm -hmm. Overall, where did that push come from? Was that an internal to your data team, the data team that you're on, or was that coming from a specific line of business or department, or was it you know, something that was, we'll say, really top-down driven that says, hey, we, we, need a, we need to treat, I think it was the TD Securities gentleman, Carl, earlier, who was talking about, hey, we need to treat data as, a, as an asset. Mm -hmm. what, what sort of drove the impetus for change uh, overall? And then I'll, I'll have one more follow on to that. Uh, so when we're thinking about the data as an asset, so it is more of, it did come from uh, the leadership. And at the same time, so I do want to allude, uh, allude to, well, I, do, I do want to like, talk about what Sender uh, initially talked in the keynote where he mentioned that say, uh, enterprise customers, large enterprise customers like Vanguard, what, what, what are the kind of issues that we are facing? It is mostly on um, integration uh, across our different data sources, and also like, have, having that, uh, like the cost considerations and, and creating that semantic layer on top of our existing data sources, which actually made us go towards a Dremio-centric uh, way of doing things, or like that, that is, that's what we are, are trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, was there a specific, you know, I'm, uh, I run the marketing team at Dremio, mm -hmm. but I also, we drink our own champagne, so we have a Dremio lake house that we use to mm -hmm. do our, all of our own analytics. 
And you know, when I think about that, is I can I can put pressure back onto you know our central analytics team, um, and I could also you know that that but that could also be something that team comes up with by themselves and mm -hmm. says, hey, look, like we we want to provide this as a capability. What what was sort of the interchange in terms of making that happen for you guys at Vanguard? So. Uh when it comes to like specific details on what actually like constitute towards that, I, I would like to like go back to the fact that uh, data strategy is it has multiple components to it. Like data being the main component, so how how re reliable our existing data is, and how well are we accessing that uh, that data, and what are the platforms that we are using it, and on top of that, there are governance con considerations, security considerations, and like the entire gamut of things and bringing value on top of that uh, like top of, uh, on top of all the investments that we make as a, as an organization and bringing out value from from any investments it's it's actually tricky and it comes down from different us from different lines of businesses it's a, a different uh, there are different vanguard as you know is a huge enterprise and we have uh, multiple lines of businesses having their own uh, data teams working together Oh. And then all these data teams uh, together, they, uh, the, the kind of challenges that they are facing are, it, it are universal across Vanguard, like be it uh, the, uh, the, cost, the cost, cost aspect, the performance, and the user experience. And we want to streamline that as an organization, and then that's the reason why we went ahead with Dremio. Got it. Yeah, so those, those data teams that mm -hmm. are internal for all those different departments and line of business are essentially your customers. Yes. And you were listening to them sort of like a, like a GM or a product manager would do and mm -hmm. say like, what are your biggest challenges? And one of the things you kept running into was, hey, like we, we keep getting bottlenecked mm -hmm. or we're not able to do what we need to do or hey, it's too expensive, I think was one of the things you started with. Mm -hmm. That was sort of what drove the, the need for change and the evaluation you guys did. Absolutely. Yeah, so like on the back side of that, you talked about value it being difficult. How are you guys looking at value and what you've been able to accomplish so far and sort of you know, what's next for you um, in terms of where you're going with your modernization efforts and trying to move faster at Vanguard? So value is a very tricky subject. I, I think uh, everyone agrees that in the data world. So what, 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 what's the value that this data team is bringing in? So is it the optimization that they are doing? And what's the optimization, uh, like putting a dollar figure on top of optimizations or even like, uh, the efficiencies that we bring in when, with respect to the time that we are seeing with individual, uh, uh, the time that we are seeing for individual analysis to go through from weeks to hours or, uh, or months to days is, uh, I, I think, uh, like the, the, we have dedicated value teams who are actually like, thinking and uh, like thinking about this kind of measurement and putting that in, into place. So, I mean, it sounds like for a lot of the teams you're supporting, um, what used to, you know, building a dashboard or maybe what they're doing now with AI, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about here in a second, was taking them a really long period of time. Now it's not taking as much time. Let's mm -hmm. call it, what would you say, like hours and, or weeks and months? That's uh, what it did take? So our initial success with uh, Dremio is that, so the initial, uh, uh, so we, we are pretty new to, to, to Dremio in general. And we, I, we believe that we still have a long way to go and the kind of optimizations on the features that we want to t extract out of Dremio is huge. And we want to do that. And uh, so the initial uh, uh, result or the initial, uh, the initial uh, feedback that I am receiving uh, from my, from the data teams is that so earlier the task that you that that uh, a data analyst would routinely depend on data engineer and wait on for um, for weeks together is can now happen in days uh, or even an hours so that in itself is huge and that that is what. Uh, almost every data team in Vanguard is excited about. If I, I think, uh, if if you look at most of their laptops, I th uh, they they do have an early sticker on yeah. top of that. Yeah, I mean, so I would that, imagine <laughs> in their case, being able to cut that down is really meaningful. Yes. Um, and like we talked earlier uh, too, and you were just saying, it's really hard to fight, figure out what's that worth. Like, an analyst can now get something done in a matter of hours or, or a day that used mm -hmm. to take a month. Like, is that worth? a million dollars, is that worth $10? You know, it, it totally depends on what 
decisions they're making, but it's required for anyone who mm -hmm. wants to have like a more data-driven culture. Mm -hmm. right? I, I, and, and also the fact that uh, uh, this level of performance improvement is something really crucial for the kind of use cases that we are looking at. So they, they were, uh, there are uh, certain use cases which require uh, this kind of performance, be it on the fraud side or okay. uh, like on the risk side. So like these use cases, they, we cannot wait for more, uh, like let, let them just go through the entire process and, and analyze the data and send, send out a report at the, uh, after like two weeks when the fraud or risk is happening right now. So we need that kind of performance and uh, like we, we are uh, we, we're going to rely on uh, tools like Dremio to, you know, to accomplish that. As you, as you push to more self-service, and mm -hmm. you mentioned the fraud and risk teams, those are, I think, great examples. Um, how do you think about governance, or how has governance had to evolve? Because you know, in, the, in, in the world where everything does have to come back to the central team, mm -hmm. while the bottleneck is tough, mm -hmm. the advantage around that, or at least the seeming advantage, is control. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, everything's got to touch this group, and I know what that group's doing, and so forth. How have you guys had to evolve thinking about governance when you're moving into a more sort of self-service and decentralized model? So governance is an, uh, is, is an active discussion that, that's happening at Vanguard. And, and also governance is at the forefront of everything that do. So I, I think as Vanguard, we are very risk averse uh, when, it, when, when it comes to data. Because we, uh, the, the responsibility that our investors are placing on us is humongous. And we, we take that responsibility really seriously, and the kind of uh, effort that we put in our governance and risk practice is uh, significant. And we, we do not want any leak of data, or even like, uh, to that matter, a, a, any, anything to go out of Vanguard, and we are placing a lot of emphasis on that. And like, before even data comes into Dremio, we are making sure that we have all the internal processes and checks in place on all the data products that we are putting in Dremio and making sure that these are, these are being accessed only by uh, the persons that these data sets are intended to be used. And, and also the fact that uh, the, the features that Dremio has, uh, mostly on the row, row level and column level uh, security, yeah. is something that uh, is of real interest to us yeah. uh, when it comes to governance and uh, making sure that people who has access to what information and then they are, they are the only ones who are accessing it. Sounds like you guys have your, you essentially have your own governance system and then you're inheriting, uh, or we're inheriting in this case, the, the rules or requirements for that person or for that attribute mm -hmm. that you guys are assigning to Dremio? Is that, is that essentially how you uh, set it up? So I, I would say yes and no to that. So uh, earlier, our approach towards governance is more about, more restricting everything. Right now, what we are trying to uh, like go ahead with is, is kind of a hybrid approach. So c can we leverage the uh, access uh, provisions within Dremio? C can we do that? So that is something we are experimenting with, and um, uh, it, it depends on the results that of those experiments that we will actually take a call on. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, th I would say, you know, because we work across multiple systems, uh, and one, it, it sounds like one of the main use cases that you have is you're bridging across different data sources, you're able to improve access to the different data consumers, mm -hmm. and you're doing that through virtualization, is yeah, sometimes we'll inherit that Mm -hmm. from existing governance systems or governance providers like mm -hmm. Privacera or, will, or homegrown systems, or people will do it directly with us, but it really just depends on what their overall data topology and architecture looks like in terms of what's yep. right for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So like in terms of moving on to, like to, to what's happening with AI at Vanguard, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about more, it seemed a little bit more, we'll say business unit, analyst driven in terms of getting to the data and reports oriented initially. You know, how are you guys evolving that with all the needs coming from the business now in terms of AI and, and we'll say a lot of the hype um, <laughs> and some of the reality around Gen AI as well. Mm -hmm. You know, what's that balance looking like for you and how are you guys thinking about evolving? So I, I think when it comes to generative AI, it is pretty universal and yeah, like everyone, uh, from boardrooms to coffee tables, they, be, they are actually talking about generative AI. And that, that's, that's no different at Vanguard as well. So the kind of emphasis, uh, 
as I said in, in the previous uh, like governance uh, question, it's more like uh, like taking a very uh, risk averse approach uh, towards generative AI and like putting putting emphasis on what what what, what the capability can do and cannot do, and knowing what the risks that it poses, and also how how we are going to mitigate all those risks uh, within the confines of uh, the infrastructure that we have, and and also making the best of it is something that we are actively looking at. Yeah, so you guys, it sounds like you guys are in a lot of like the we'll say the testing and evaluation phase as it relates to generative AI. Isn't everyone? Um, I it not, I wouldn't I think it's not so some companies are definitely in production where oh, they, they we have, have models too. working they're typically they're okay you're just I see what you're saying <laughs> so it's not like a dev test model necessarily it can be a production model but it's still evolving in terms of how the performance of that and what you expect it to do and how do you improve that and so forth as you're using that yeah those technologies what what about just in terms of machine learning as well like how is that has that been evolving at the same time, or do you have a lot of data scientists who now able to access data more quickly and put that into their model building or feature engineering processes? So that that is something that is something of interest to us. But uh, right now, the emphasis that we are uh, putting on is more on data analysts and uh, the business users. Making uh, data literacy is at the forefront of everything that we are doing currently. And the business users and data analysts are at the core of our uh, uh, like Dremio strategy, at least. Yep. So slowly, we do want to uh, enab enable this to our uh, machine learning and data science teams as well, because uh, we want them to leverage uh, the capabilities and the performance improvements that uh, we are getting out of uh, Dremio. And then that slowly, like, enhancing their entire uh, model building life cycle. Are you thinking of that more as like a citizen data science? Or are you thinking of this more in terms, like meaning the analysts themselves mm -hmm. doing AI for BI or actually like building their own models that mm -hmm. are then you know hosted and running and are in production? Mm -hmm. Or is it, hey, no, this is like for the actual data scientists coming in? Like what, how are you guys thinking about that? Because there's two camps here, there's like, right? There's a group using all the open source tools, and then there's the group using a bunch of, you know, let's say the auto ML tools. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's both, right? But you sort of get into this world, and it's like, well, who are you really serving? And I think it's really important to understand the customer in those cases. So uh, we, we are trying to carve out uh, the niche for Dremio, mostly on uh, the data analyst and the citizen data scientist segment. Uh, and like depending on the success that we uh, we see with uh, data analysts and citizen data, that is that is when we would actually go towards uh, uh, a, an advanced data scientist or even the machine learning engineer. Yeah, so you guys are almost attacking uh, department by department. Mm -hmm. In terms, attacking is maybe the wrong word, but but you're you're trying to modernize or develop the way that the company can move forward so, in, that, in that manner, and then also by persona. So we we, we uh, like I. Like persona is something that, uh, that that's a good good uh, term to use because like we we are excessively focused on the data analyst and the business user persona right now. Yep. So da data data scientist and uh, machine learning engineer is something we we s certainly see that Remio can provide advantage uh, to to the model building life cycle. But uh, right now our emphasis is on uh, these two personas. Okay. Yeah. You know, on the business user, you know what. What are you, you know, what are gaps that still exist? What are you hoping for, whether it's from us or from the market in general, in terms of what, what takes the business user to be more productive going, we'll say shifting left, using Sender's uh, talk from this morning, you know, how, how, do they, how do they get closer to the data if they don't write SQL? Uh, well, if they can say something and it is delivered in a report, that is the world that I want yeah. for the business users because I think that's the world that even the business users would want. Uh, it's, it's just that would with the advent of generative AI and the assisted tools, so it would we really want them to uh, be re re uh, literate about SQL and other tools when Gen AI can uh, do things? It, it's it's an active debate, but yet, yet we are uh, we as a company we are actually like, putting emphasis on like uh, like 
we have a big data literacy project where, wherein people actively are trying to make um, like senior, uh, senior leaders within the organization more literate about data and everything that's happening with data. Well, let's talk about that because TD Securities brought that data literacy mm -hmm. term up mm -hmm. like earlier today. Mm -hmm. You said data literacy is hard. You know, what, what does your program consist of? And then how do you know if you're making progress on a program like that? Well, I, I think uh, I, I'm not a really good person to answer that question, but I'll try to answer it as, as best as I can. Because uh, so when it comes to data literacy, our, our prime focus is to make, uh, at, le at least make uh, the leadership uh, aware of different uh, data terms and the technologies out there. And, and then make, make them proficient in at least the, the knowledge of it, the verbos, uh, the, the verbiage of it, rather than um, going in deep. And this is, I, I think they are, they are taking a tiered approach, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure about that because I'm not uh, involved in, the, in that. So in this case, it's, it's mainly education. Yes. And the education is around, it sounds like common terminology, mm -hmm. things associated with statistics, yep. likely, and then as they would understand that, then as they're reviewing reports or information's brought to them, they have a background in terms of mm -hmm. how to do that. Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. No, I, was, I know the terms thrown around as people building data cultures, what does it mean to be more literate? Um, I think some of, these, some of these programs have like actual training, like, mm -hmm. like certifications built in. Some of them mean like you actually are doing, you know, you're, you're doing more with data individually. So, like so I, we, we do have uh, those training internal, uh, internally developed trainings. They involve all, all these components. It's just that I'm not privy yeah, to, the, uh, to the complete details of it, so that's the reason why I'm not commenting about it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna take one thing back to Dremio real quick. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about text to SQL this morning. Mm -hmm. From a Gen AI perspective, we talked about labeling and creating of wikis from a Gen AI perspective. And part of that's obviously to help the analyst because mm -hmm. if you could use Gen AI to help the analyst, could they go do all that themselves? Sure. Are we cutting the time down? Yes. Could we, do we still give them the SQL to edit? Yes. So if they look at what Gen AI gives them and they're like, no, I want to change that or I don't like the way that's written, they can go edit it. You, do you see, as you're starting to move even more to the business user, do you see using tool sets and sort of the user experience within something like Dremio? Or do you see that coming from tool sets that are like, that would connect to us, let's say like Tableau. Uh, one of the gentlemen earlier talked about superset, Apache superset, or do you see developing that yourself, you know, in terms of bringing that and starting to work on that group? So uh, this is some, this is a, actually a tricky question because like uh, nowadays when you look at uh, different products out there, every product is throwing in a Gen AI component to it. Right. Yep. So Tableau has a Gen AI component to it, so Dremio, is, Dremio has one. And we internally have uh, Gen, AI, Gen AI for different tasks. So how, how are we going to marry all these components together is something, is, is something that we haven't uh, put, a, put a nail to it because uh, firstly, we, we haven't experimented with the Gen AI components of all tools together and marry them together to actually see what is the experience like. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we would, we would always think about what is the best experience that we are delivering to our end users, be it data analysts or business users. And what, what is best for them is something that is of interest to us. And if, if an experience includes uh, Dremio's generative AI and not other, other prior generative AI, is some, we will pick that. So we will make that decision based off of the user experience that we are delivering end to end. Yeah, I mean, is that an active project or an active priority for you? Or is that something where it's like, yeah, we need to solve this, but we're sort of, you know, we'll, we'll call it the Wild West is good enough, as long as it's governed, still governed, but, you know, people can choose the tools they want or deal with it they, the way they want to, or are you guys actively trying to create a layer for that audience and move that through? So I think uh, I, I would answer that question uh, in this way. So we are taking baby steps towards that future. Right now, what we are trying to do is, okay, there is this, uh, the entire data analytics life cycle. Let us see what are the self-service components out there and, and enable them so that data analyst is, uh, data analyst is, can do self-serve. 
And now, once they are done with that, okay, how can we improve that experience uh, one after another? So what are the different features? Yeah, of course, Gen AI plays a vital role in that. So where, where do we fit, fit Gen AI into this experience is yeah. something that we will discuss. I'm more asking like relative priority, mm -hmm. meaning like, what are you, you, you guys have put Dremio in, people are able to move faster, mm -hmm. you're expanding into some other departments, but like, what's really important for you now? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and is this one of those things, or is it actually not one of those things, and you're focused on like more core, core elements? So, uh, I would uh, again go back to the initial comment that I've made. So, it's about user experience, costs, and performance. So user experience, uh, and we believe that generative AI be, has okay. a greater uh, like play a role to play in the user experience component of it. So it's definitely in, in uh, it, it is something that we are looking towards. Got it. Yeah. So what are what are some technologies that you guys are looking at now, uh, overall that might be you know just out you know, in the overall lake house environment mm -hmm. that you're working on from a you know user experience or performance type of environment that you're trying to add in, or are you guys really just baking what you have? and just expanding that usage internally? So I, I think more of a latter. So yeah. we, we are baking what, what we have and then expanding the usage. At the same time, striving to make sure that the entire user experience is streamlined. Okay, yeah. So like what are, as you're trying to expand mm -hmm. usage, what's hard about that? Like what challenges are you running into in terms of you've built the platform, you know the users that are using it are getting value, mm -hmm. but like how do you actually you know, it's sort of like you're trying to acquire customers, right? Like, what challenges do you run into trying to make that happen? So the number one challenge that uh, that I, I would think is on the cost aspect of it. So it's more mostly on, um, so when we are thinking about costs, so what, what what's the best argument that we, we are putting forward? So how, like, there, there are different perceptions of different tools out there. And how are we, ma and even the transition cost, it, it actually matters. So we are thinking that we think about that in a holistic way and then approaching that. So like your argument to the, to the data teams that would use the platform and the other lines of business is basically, hey, we're doing, maybe you guys do chargebacks. I'm not sure how it works, mm -hmm. but you're basically saying, look, you have this cost structure today. Here's your switching cost. And once you do that, you're, this is what your payback period sort of looks like before your costs start to drop and that that actually affects that lines of business budget in a positive way and that's sort of how the, we'll call it the internal sale happens. Yeah, absolutely. That's correct, that's amazing. Looks like it's like we, we can have you do the sales pitch internally. It, 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 I, <laughs> I, I feel like it's like marketing internally at Vanguard is like the, the, the Another job <laughs> for adoption. You know, putting the, it's really putting the business case together. Um, it's something that we've done at Dremio. You know, I'm not sure how many people in the room have, you know, have experienced our calculator, but like, we built a TCO calculator mm -hmm. exactly for this reason, is we have a lot of customers, like, like Sender talked about, where cost is really important, and we're just like, well, let's just lay it out for them in terms mm -hmm. of what we see on average for both sort of labor and price performance and software costs. You know, you package those things together, mm -hmm. and you say, this is, this is what it looks like in option A, and this is what it looks like in option B, um, and then it's like, you know, if option B looks better, how fast can I get to, what's the payback period is a common way that people will look at it. Um, and then they'll look out at, hey, how, what, what's the ROI over time too? I'm not saying they don't do that, but like, hey, will this pay back in three months with existing budget kind of, kind of or will it pay back in six months? Uh, is always really interesting to them, time to value. Yep. Okay, great. Well, No I wonder you're the CMO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs>